This is Dr. Matt Barber. Welcome to our joint replacement camp or class. This details my recovery protocol for my patients that are having knee or hip surgery. If you are one of my patients or a friend or family member who's helping coach, uh, welcome aboard. Uh, we've got a lot of information for you here. If you're not one of my patients and just happen to be watching this, uh, welcome. Uh, we hope that you enjoy it. Uh, please remember that this is for general informational purposes and does not constitute specific medical advice. If you're undergoing joint replacement with another surgeon, uh, there are reasonable surgeons who may do things differently or have a different outlook on things. This is my particular protocol, so keep that in mind. Uh, welcome and thank you. Our objectives here are very straightforward. We want to talk about surgery. We want to talk about what expectations you should have. The more you know about this process, the more you can be a very active participant you can help to minimize your risk, maximize the outcome that you have, and know what to expect from the surgery. That just makes this whole process easier for you. Expectations after joint replacement surgery. Our goal is to have a forgotten joint. This is a replaced joint that functions so painlessly and so well that you forget that you have it. In all honesty, uh, that does not happen uh, very often. Happens a little bit more for hip replacements than knee replacements, but it's probably uh, more of the exception than the rule. For most patients, really for all patients, this is never like your natural hip or knee. This is not what you were born with. This is not recreating your joints when you were 18 years old. Um, You'll notice numbness around surgical incisions. Knee replacements may click or make some noise. Hips or knees may have soreness in the soft tissues. So even though the joint has been quote-unquote replaced, even though we put in these artificial parts to restore areas that have been damaged by trauma or by arthritis, this is never uh, like a normal joint. However, with that said, for the overwhelming majority of patients, uh, the results are really excellent. They have excellent relief of their pain and uh, a much improved uh, lifestyle after these surgeries. So just keep that in mind. Also keep in mind that everyone's experience will be unique. Every patient is different. They come into these procedures in different states of physical health with different levels of strength and stamina at all different ages. So everyone's experience is going to be completely different. And for a lot of patients, even if they have one knee done and then the other or one hip done and then the other, they may have a different recovery experience between uh, a left or right side for a variety of reasons. We attempt to do these procedures in a way that is very reproducible and with a protocol that is very similar but outcomes are always a little bit different with every surgery and with every patient. Got a big list here on this slide of potential complications. So when we have a preoperative visit, I discuss these with patients, but there are very general risks that occur any time that you have surgery. Those are bleeding, nerve damage, medical issues like heart attacks or strokes, allergic reactions, anesthesia problems, infections. These can happen anytime anyone has surgery. Fortunately, these are very uncommon occurrences. Statistically, they are very unlikely. Specific for knee and hip replacement procedures, uh, patients can have bone fractures that occur when putting implants in. They can have joints that are loose or tight that are uh, stiff or unstable. Um, and other uh, potential unforeseen issues. Again, as awful as these things sound, it's important to know that most people don't experience these, uh, but they can happen. Um, we do everything that we can to prevent all of these issues and ensure that our patients have a great outcome. But ultimately, some of these things uh, will happen to some percentage of patients, and I can't promise you that you won't have these, what I can let you know is that we're in this together. 
I'm here to help you in any way that I can to get you through this process so that you can do well and get back to the kind of lifestyle that you want to. Other expectations, uh, generally most patients can do pretty much whatever they want to do uh, after joint replacement surgery once they've recovered. Uh, Patients often return to golf, tennis, uh, other exercise, um, impact loading like jogging, things where patients jump or where both feet leave the ground and they impact load the joint uh, are discouraged. There's not uh, a lot of published evidence to really prove that this will cause uh, loosening or cause problems with implants. But for most of us that do this a lot and do specialize in this, we discourage patients from running for exercise or otherwise impact loading the joint. With knee replacements, uh, patients may have difficulty kneeling. Up to about 30% of patients just never really can uh, kneel on the affected side even after they've healed. So patients that have to kneel for work or love to garden or do things where they would kneel will often use a knee pad for those types of activities. It's also uh, always possible to dislocate a prosthetic hip pop it out of socket with extreme twisting maneuvers uh, in any direction. Now, these are very uncommon positions that most people don't encounter routinely. So as long as you spend some time letting the soft tissues heal after surgery for a couple of months, uh, the chances of having this kind of event are very low, but it's important to keep in mind that extreme twisting postures can cause a problem. So you're watching this talk. So you're engaged already, and it is really important that you be an active participant in this surgery. This is not happening to you. This is happening for you. So we want you to be prepared. We want you to get yourself ready and get your home ready. We're going to set you up with a physical therapist for a preoperative visit. They're going to talk to you about the protocol that we'll use and help coach you on some basic exercises. And I'll have another slide on that. Very important to get a coach. This can be a spouse, a friend, another family member, somebody to help you out in the first couple of days when you get home from surgery, up to a couple of weeks. But for most people, a few days is sufficient. And afterwards, if someone can just check in on you here and there, you'll probably do okay. This person can help with uh, arranging medicines, helping you apply ice or cold packs uh, to the surgical site. They can help with preparing meals. They also can help monitor your activity, kind of give a sense of, of what you're doing and if it's enough or if it's too much. And they can help you communicate with my team about any problems. So this is our road to success, this, uh, pathway of engagement that we've talked about, and it is very much a team approach. For you as a patient, it's important that you are informed about this. This is why you're watching this video. Uh, We want your coach that you've selected to watch this. So forward this video to every friend or family member who might be involved in helping care for you after surgery and helping you along. We want them to see it. We want them to be informed and, and helping you. We want you to be medically optimized. What that means is not that you won't have any medical problems because a lot of people have chronic health issues like high blood pressure or diabetes or other problems that they're managing, but we want those to be well-managed and stable and under control prior to you having surgery. We're going to teach you about how to optimize your nutrition for surgery We want to do everything possible to just basically turn your body into a healing machine so that you're ready uh, after surgery to to get started, to heal up quickly, and to have a great outcome. We've talked about your coach. Uh, They're a, a huge part of your team. You want them to know what's going on. You want them to know how to assist you. From my side, I am a specialist in these types of procedures. I'm fellowship trained in joint replacement surgery. And my practice is exclusively dedicated to knee and hip replacement surgery. I also have a team in place. You uh, likely have met one of my physician assistants or my nurses. Uh, These are great people 
that I've selected as part of my team, and I trust them completely to assist me in providing you with the best possible care. In terms of institution, we do these procedures at hospitals and at surgery centers where the teams have a lot of experience and where they do these procedures frequently. There is a fair amount of published evidence in the orthopedic literature that surgeons and institutions that do these kind of procedures in higher volumes have better outcomes and lower complication rates. So we're putting all those things together to have a team approach so that we get the best possible outcome. Nutritional optimization. We want you to be healthy and doing well so you can heal after surgery. Protein is the big driver here. Uh, This is part of what your tissues need to heal, so we encourage you to eat at least 100 grams of protein a day. Start looking at a couple of labels. Make sure you're getting uh, some good lean meats, greens, whole grains, berries, nuts, just general good healthy food. Um, Before and after surgery, This is not a good time for a lot of fried foods, overly processed food with a lot of sugar. We're we're after good, healthy food choices. In addition, uh, if possible, we'd like for you to take a multivitamin daily, uh, just available at any drugstore or a big uh, grocery chain. And 2,000 IUs or international units of vitamin D, vitamin D3 a day. Uh, those uh, can assist with your healing. I do also recommend the MEND joint replacement supplement. This is an essential amino acid formula. And and while I typically don't uh, try to recommend specific things, uh, this formulation has been studied. They have published uh, randomized trials to show uh, less muscle loss after these types of surgeries and improved healing. So I would encourage you to get that. You should have a flyer from my office that will tell you where you can order that. As a uh, potential substitute that sometimes may be easier or quicker, um, isopure uh, type uh, protein amino acid formula is available a lot of times at health food stores or on Amazon. Big uh, yellow letters at the bottom of the screen there, though. If your primary doctor or your gastroenterologist or another uh, physician of yours has you on a specific diet, then you keep following that. Uh, These are general guidelines. If you have specific dietary or medical issues that require a different diet, stick with that. Preparing your home. We want to get your home ready for you to come home after surgery and have a safe and uneventful recovery. So think ahead, start planning this out before surgery. Remove any tripping hazards like loose rugs, extension cords, anything that would potentially trip you up. Think about things that you're going to need afterwards and set those at arm level. So phone, remote control, anything else you need, uh, have that on a table or stand that's near you and at a conveniently uh, located height. Dark areas, go ahead and put up some night lights or other small lights for any places that you might walk at night. Think about how you may be trying to navigate in the dark after surgery and prepare for that. Showers, um, you can shower right away after surgery and we'll go over that a little bit more, uh, but you want non-skid surfaces And if you don't have a bench, uh, we'll work on getting a shower chair for you uh, for after surgery. Generally, in your home, remove any clutter, anything that might keep you from getting around. Consider that you may have a walker or a cane for a little while after surgery, and you need plenty of room to navigate with those. Make arrangements for your rambunctious pets. If you've got large dogs or other animals that may knock you over or scratch you or get your uh, bandage dirty, uh, they may need to stay with a friend or be boarded or have other arrangements. Your, uh, your goldfish is probably safe, but just uh, know your pets and, and think about how you're going to interact with them after your surgery. Stairs, a lot of people have in their home, and you will be in 
almost every instance, able to navigate stairs immediately after surgery, but it's going to be very slow in those first couple of days, and stairs will be one at a time for a while. So just plan ahead. Uh, for some patients, that means that they have stairs going into their home, and they go up those stairs once when they come home from the hospital or surgery center, and then they just walk around inside for the first week or so until they get more comfortable. Some people may have an upstairs bedroom, and so they prepare a sleeping area downstairs, or they continue to sleep upstairs but just plan their, their trips out really carefully, and they only make that, that trip once a day. Anything you can do to make some good healthy meals and have those pre-prepared or even frozen and ready to go after surgery is going to make things easier for you. So think about that in the few weeks ahead and start getting all of that ready. Enlist your coach or any family members or friends to help you prepare. You will have a pre-op visit that my team will help you schedule at either the surgery center or the hospital where your procedure is taking place. They're going to do a few things at that visit, and a lot of this relates to your anesthesia care, making sure that you're safe for that and helping them be prepared. They'll do some labs, basically some blood work. They will typically do an EKG as well, and they'll just interview you. They'll talk to you and ask you some health questions to make sure that everything is, uh, is clear for you to have surgery. As we've said, a big focus of being prepared for surgery is to help prevent complications. A uncommon but very serious potential complication of surgery is a blood clot or deep vein thrombosis. So we want to address this in every way that we can. From a surgical standpoint, we try to have very efficient surgical times, we use less invasive techniques whenever possible. From a patient standpoint, we get you moving very early and very frequently after surgery. Uh, that mobilization is probably the biggest thing to help prevent clots. We also use medications. Every patient after surgery will be on some type of blood thinner. For most patients who are not high risk, in other words, they do not have a strong personal history or family history of blood clots. That medication will typically be just a low-dose aspirin twice a day. Uh, for other patients who have clotting disorders or a strong family history or other risk factors, they may be on Eliquis or Xarelto or Coumadin or some other more aggressive blood thinning medications. Of note, I do not use uh, compression stockings or TED hose routinely. These have not been shown to reduce the incidence of blood clots after these types of surgeries, and they were very uh, inconvenient for patients. So many of us have uh, abandoned these uh, several years ago, and uh, so you will, if anyone asks you, um, those are not part of my protocol. If you have compression stockings or want to use one after surgery to help with swelling, that is perfectly fine. We will uh, even get you a prescription if you need one for these, but I don't use these routinely. So if you encounter a friend or a physical therapist or some other health care provider who asks you, um, we do not use them routinely, and so you are not intended to have them after surgery. Infection after knee or hip replacement surgery is overall an uncommon complication. The incidence is somewhere around 1%. And we take every possible measure to try to prevent this because these are very serious complications. From a patient standpoint, we ask that you not have injections in the operative joint for three months before surgery. In other words, if you have a knee injection, you do not need to have surgery on that knee for three months. It's been shown that having those in close proximity to surgery can increase your infection risk. In terms of care for your skin, we want to avoid scratches or wounds uh, at the time right before surgery, so be careful around pets or working in the yard. We don't want to create any wounds that could harbor bacteria or be a potential source for infection. Do not shave your skin 
for surgery at the operative site. Uh, the preoperative nurses will help prepare the area for you. If you shave uh, routinely, uh, please stop for about three to four days prior to surgery. Uh, this is done with a special set of skin clippers and in a particular manner in the preoperative area of the surgery center or hospital uh, so that we don't create nicks or potential places for bacteria to hide out. Medical issues. As we talked about, we want those to be optimized prior to surgery. It's very important that diabetics have blood sugars that are well controlled. We'll look at your hemoglobin A1C prior to surgery, and if it's not below a certain level, we may defer surgery until that can be managed. Diabetes that's not well controlled basically compromises your immune system. It makes your white blood cells not work as well. You are not as able to fight infection, and it puts you at increased risk for having problems after surgery. So we want that to be well controlled and well optimized prior to surgery. Obesity is also an independent risk factor for infection. At certain body mass indexes, we will again uh, ask patients to defer their surgery and lose weight prior to having surgery so that their risk profile is more normal. Smoking is a huge risk factor for wound problems or infections. Uh, you need to stop this before surgery if you are smoking and ideally stop permanently, uh, but if not, at least stop prior to surgery and for the first several weeks afterwards until your wound is fully healed. Preoperative skin cleansing we talked about. When you go to that preoperative visit, the uh, surgery center or hospital staff is going to give you the chlorhexidine soap or wipes to prepare your skin. At the time of surgery, Every patient receiving a knee or hip replacement is given IV antibiotics. Those will vary a little bit depending on any allergies that you might have. And some patients, but not all, will be given oral antibiotics to take postoperatively. At the time of this, uh, at the time of the preparation of this talk, uh, it's not recommended that every patient receive post-op oral antibiotics, but those with additional risk factors uh, will be given a prescription. In terms of the surgery itself, like we talked about, we want to use good techniques that are less invasive when possible. Uh, we want to be efficient in our surgical times. And again, uh, we want everyone to uh, stop smoking before surgery if you do so now. Managing pain after surgery and preventing pain and problems associated with pain medicines is a big focus of what we do uh, in and around surgery. We use what's referred to as a multimodal protocol. That means that we use non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, medications specifically intended to treat nerve pain. We use cryotherapy with cold packs or ice machines. We use steroids. We use elevation to help control swelling and edema around the surgical site. And we use nerve blocks that are given by our anesthesiologist all to help uh, control pain. We want to prevent pain before it happens and we want your pain to be well controlled so that you can have uh, a good recovery. We do use uh, opiate pain medications, uh, and we use them sparingly. And it's very important that anyone undergoing surgery appreciate the risk associated with these medications. These are very dangerous and highly addictive medicines, and we use them for very brief periods uh, just to help control uh, more severe pain immediately after surgery. It's important that you understand the risk associated with these. The numbers 3, 13, and 30 are really important. If we give you a one-day prescription for opiate pain medicine, you have a 3% risk of still being on those medications a year afterwards. If we give you a one-week prescription for opiate pain medicines, you have a 13% risk of being on those medications one year after surgery. 
And if you take a one-month prescription of narcotic pain medicine, you are at a 30% risk of still being on those medicines one year after surgery. So these are highly addictive, and it's important to appreciate that. Uh, For most patients, we use one prescription of narcotics, and only in more uh, extreme circumstances would we refill these medications. So just consider that carefully and be aware that we're going to try to use a lot of different techniques and other medicines and other uh, technologies to help control your pain around the time of surgery. Using cryotherapy or ice is very important after surgery, particularly with knee replacement, to help control pain and control swelling. The more we can keep the swelling down after surgery, the less pain you're going to have and the easier it is to mobilize your knee. We want to use ice or cold therapy very frequently, uh, but also carefully. Do, don't put uh, ice or a cold device directly on the skin. Some cold devices will have a built-in pad, uh, but for most, and certainly if using an ice pack or cold pack, use some sort of barrier layer, whether it's a thin towel or a pillowcase or something uh, to keep the cold uh, not directly on the skin. You want to move the ice or a cold pack or cold therapy uh, device to multiple sites around your leg, around the knee. You can move it to the front, back, sides. Uh, Move it around to try to hit a lot of different areas and help with uh, swelling control. And you do want to occasionally, during the day, allow the leg to return to room temperature and sort of warm back up in between those icing sessions. Other than that, you can do this very frequently, and it helps a lot with uh, swelling. I've had uh, knee surgery myself and have used a very similar device to the one pictured, so cold therapy is, uh, is a big thing after these types of procedures. Incision care after joint replacement is very important. We use a dressing that is sealed and waterproof, uh, so you can shower immediately. This is antimicrobial and absorbent. So basically, these dressings are specially designed to pull moisture away from the incision, and they contain silver or other antimicrobial compounds that help to prevent infection. As noted, this is sealed. Uh, It allows you to shower immediately. And we typically will leave these in place until your follow-up visit. If you see the picture at the top, That's obviously one that's completely clean and dry and has probably just been placed. Um, The one on the bottom right uh, shows a little bit of drainage or bleeding at the incision site, and a small amount is very common. So if you see some bleeding or a little bit of drainage on the dressing, that can be very, very normal in the first several days after surgery. Now, that particular bandage is getting a little bit full It's saturated all the way out to the sides. So if that patient has a follow-up visit in a day or so, that's probably fine to stay on until then. Uh, But if if it's going to be a week or so before that visit, then uh, let our office know so that we can uh, help you get that changed. I don't routinely use compressive wraps on the leg after surgery. Uh, but they are okay. If you would like to use an ACE wrap or something similar, uh, just make sure that you uh, take that off fairly frequently and make sure that it's not too tight and uh, cutting off uh, circulation uh, to the leg. Dental care and joint replacement. Dental clearance is not required for surgery if you do not have mouth pain and you've had regular dental care. If it's been uh, quite a while since you've been to the dentist or you have any pain in your teeth or mouth, uh, we want to have you seen and make sure that you don't have any active infections uh, prior to surgery. Please go ahead and complete any needed dental care a few weeks before surgery, if at all possible. And then afterwards, uh, wait at least three months after surgery uh, before having any elective dental work or cleanings. The reason for this is that dental cleaning uh, can seed bacteria into your bloodstream 
uh, when cleaning below the gum line. And so we want to avoid any risk of infection associated with that. While it's not uh, specifically uh, associated with dental care, I included uh, pedicures here as the process is very similar. Uh, you may, if you're having a knee or hip replacement, want to go ahead and have that done a few weeks before surgery uh, because it will be a little more difficult to get to your toenails uh, for the first little while after your procedure. So you can have that out of the way. Similarly, we would like for you to wait a little while uh, for things to be healed before you return to, uh, to doing this. I do recommend after joint replacement surgery that you take antibiotics before dental cleanings uh, as a matter of routine. Uh, this is one dose of antibiotics that's taken about an hour before the cleaning, and we are always happy to uh, get a prescription for this for you without you coming in for an office visit. Um, some surgeons and some dentists will discontinue this process after two years. That is uh, very reasonable. I, I still recommend that you do it lifelong. If you have more than one prosthetic joint or you have immune compromising conditions like diabetes, uh, I even more strongly recommend that that be lifelong. Unfortunately, bowel issues uh, can be a problem after joint replacement surgery, so we want to talk about those and head those off. Anesthesia, as well as narcotic pain medicines, uh, can certainly cause and aggravate issues with uh, constipation, especially. So it's very important that after surgery, you drink plenty of fluids, water, sports drinks, juices. Again, just another reason to uh, limit narcotic pain medicines and eliminate those as quickly as you can. Uh, you should start uh, daily after surgery with one serving of Miralax. This is available over the counter at any drugstore or supermarket. And it is a, a powder that's mixed into uh, liquid solution, whatever uh, drink you prefer, water, juice, or other for this. Um, and that can be increased as needed. In other words, you can move to a twice daily serving or even a, uh, a four times normal uh, dose of this if needed. But proceed slowly with that and make sure that you are drinking plenty of fluids to help that work. If you've not had a bowel movement by day four after surgery, contact our office so we can assist you. Physical therapy is a vitally important part of joint replacement surgery. You will uh, receive a preoperative therapy appointment. At this time, the therapist should go over with you basic home safety, some of the things that we've talked about, stair climbing, how to get in and out of a vehicle, basic things that you will need and want to know after joint replacement surgery. They should review with you my particular exercise protocol for joint replacement surgery that you see uh, in the picture associated with this slide. Uh, links to that video are in the notes section. Um, they'll go over that with you. You will also receive that video so that you know what you'll be doing after surgery. For most patients, we start off with home therapy immediately after returning home from surgery. And for some, they're able to do a lot of their therapy self-directed with the use of videos and an occasional check-in with a therapist. Other patients may need more outpatient therapy, and we will arrange that at your post-operative follow-up visit. I do not routinely use CPM machines. That is a continuous passive motion machine that you see. I used them for quite a long time, and a lot of other surgeons have. The published literature on this has been very clear that they do not uh, improve outcomes. Um, over time, I felt like I was having more trouble with them than I was improvement. I stopped using them routinely several years ago, and our results have been as good or probably better. So 
you may have encountered a friend, a therapist, someone who has used this machine. You may have even seen me as a patient back when I used them routinely, uh, but I do not, uh, as a matter of course, use them anymore. In certain special circumstances, we may uh, use them for specific patients, but don't worry. Uh, what we've provided you is what we believe to be the best thing to help get you a great result after surgery. As you improve with uh, your uh, therapy, you'll eventually get transitioned uh, to a home exercise program, and you can start to do more normal things and more normal exercises. Medications. Um, there's a lot of things that you need to know immediately before surgery. You'll receive a handout on this. But it's important that one week before surgery, you stop any blood thinners unless you've been advised otherwise by your cardiologist or other physician. You need to stop blood thinners like aspirin, Plavix, Xarelto, Eliquis, Coumadin, all these others. Obviously, we don't want you to have a bleeding event during surgery. Also, stop non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medicines or arthritis medicines, that's ibuprofen, Aleve, naproxen, Motrin, Celebrex, Diclofenac, Mobic, all of these medications should be stopped about a week before. Uh, these medicines can inhibit your platelets, and so for the same reason, they can cause bleeding issues. Perfectly okay to keep taking multivitamins, minerals, probiotics, vitamin C, vitamin D that we recommended to you earlier. Uh, stop any specific vitamin E supplements a week before surgery. Uh, vitamin E can act as a very subtle blood thinner in high doses. Your multivitamin will contain vitamin E. Your food will contain vitamin E. That's perfectly fine. Keep doing that, but just stop any separate dosing of vitamin E. Stop any herbal supplements, ephedra, garlic, ginkgo, ginseng, St. John's wort, valerian, kava, there are a bunch of those. Uh, several of these can affect anesthesia drugs and cause them to not work as well or work longer than they're supposed to. They can affect the metabolism of some of these compounds, so stop those a week before surgery. If you continue to take those, it could result in your surgery being canceled or delayed, and we don't want that. Two to three days before surgery, you need to stop any stimulant medications, Adderall, Ritalin, Vyvanse, Adipex. These are a lot of uh, attention deficit drugs, diet medications, anything that is a stimulant. You want to stop a couple of days before surgery. Similar thing, it can affect your anesthesia. So the day of surgery, you've made it all the way to the surgery date. On the day of, we don't want you to take any diuretics. Those are fluid pills, things like HCTZ, hydrochlorothiazide, Lasix. Uh, similarly, metformin or any oral diabetes medications, do not take those on the day of surgery. Do take your blood pressure medicines. Just take those with a sip of water. Uh, at the time that you normally would. Do use any inhalers that you've been prescribed for asthma or other conditions. And do continue to drink uh, clear, non-alcoholic liquids until two hours before your arrival time. Uh, being well hydrated can actually help prevent nausea after surgery, helps you feel better, helps you mobilize quicker after surgery couple things to keep in mind. We, we know your arrival time and when you're supposed to be there. Surgery times are a little bit harder to pin down. We don't know exactly when we will start most cases in the operating room, so base this on your arrival time. Sports drinks, water are great. Black coffee. Uh, if you're drinking coffee, uh, no cream in that, no juices with pulp. Anything should be clear, so clear liquids only up until two hours before your arrival time. Uh, don't, don't roll into the surgery center with a cup of coffee in your hand uh, or your surgery time might get delayed. You want it to be two hours before your arrival. 
There are a lot of medications that you may have after surgery, and we get a lot of questions about this, so I want to give a very broad overview. Uh, Please keep in mind that you will almost certainly not have all of these medications, but we use a lot of them at different times, and some people will be on combinations of these, and we want you to understand a little bit about them. In terms of pain medicine or narcotics, you may receive Percocet or Norco. Those are oxycodone and hydrocodone, respectively. Both of these formulations contain acetaminophen or Tylenol in them. Uh, They are both uh, very strong, very uh, addictive narcotics. Uh, But keep in mind uh, as well that if you are going to take Tylenol at any point, these medicines contain Tylenol or acetaminophen as well. So you want to be careful about combining those and not exceeding an acceptable dose of acetaminophen. We use tramadol as well. Uh, This is a Schedule 3 medication versus Percocet and Norco, which are Schedule 2 medications. Uh, It does not contain Tylenol, uh, so it can be taken in conjunction with Tylenol and is also a good uh, pain reliever. We will generally try to start weaning you from all of these uh, as quickly as possible. As we discussed, Uh, These are the most dangerous and the most addictive uh, drugs. Anti-inflammatories. We will usually have you on uh, an anti-inflammatory medicine of some type. Celebrex, Mobic, Aleve, Motrin, Voltaren. We use a lot of these very commonly. They can be very helpful. All can have the potential side effect of stomach irritation. So be on the lookout for that. If you start to have any gastric distress with them, we may need to stop those or switch to something else. You may be prescribed one of these routinely after surgery. If it's not working or you want to take another one, that's fine. We can typically switch that. Just be mindful that you need to pick one. In other words, if you're taking Celebrex already, you don't need to start taking Motrin or ibuprofen in addition to that. So uh, if you had one that you used routinely before surgery with good results, you can go back on that. If not, then we may use Celebrex or another uh, one uh, for a few weeks postoperatively. Muscle relaxers. Uh, Those are exactly like they sound. These are medications that help with muscle spasm, which you may experience after surgery. These are Flexoril which is cyclobenzaprine, Robaxin, Xanaflex, or several of those. Uh, basically use those as needed. They uh, certainly can make you sleepy, so be considerate of that uh, while you're recovering. Tylenol or acetaminophen we talked about. This is an excellent non-narcotic pain reliever. As we noted, don't combine that with Percocet or Norco, which contain Tylenol already. Miralax, another medication that we talked about. You need to pick that up preoperatively and have that on hand. Looks like the bottle pictured on the right. This is a powder solution that's mixed into the, uh, or measured rather, in the cap of the bottle and then mixed in liquid to drink. You can increase that dose to two or even four times the normal dose in a given day if you're... uh, not having results with a smaller dose. Remember, you need lots of water and fluids to make that medicine work. Prednisone is a steroid. You may be placed on a small dose of this for a couple of weeks after surgery to help control inflammation. It's one of the medicines that's part of our protocol that we use to help control that swelling and control inflammation and help you recover quicker. Antibiotics, we talked as well. Uh, You may not have a prescription for these if you don't have particular risk factors for infection. Remember, if you are prescribed these, to take the full course as prescribed. Blood thinners, this will be aspirin for most patients. Our typical protocol is an 81-milligram aspirin twice daily 
for about the first six weeks after surgery. Other patients who are higher risk or routinely were on blood thinners before surgery will be on something different. Uh, by six weeks, if you're getting around well and not having any issues, then you can go back to doing whatever you were doing before surgery. So if you are not on aspirin or other blood thinners before surgery, go back to doing that. If you were taking a once-a-day aspirin or if you were on some other blood thinner, go back to whatever you were doing before surgery at the recommendation of your primary doctor. When considering medications, uh, try to get refill requests into us uh, between Monday and Thursday and plan for a 24 to 48 hour lead time to get those turned around. I may be in surgery, my assistants may be in surgery. Uh, try not to get yourself backed into a corner in terms of, of timing for refill request on some of these medications. All right, so the day of surgery has finally arrived. Uh, when you arrive at the surgery center or hospital, you want to bring some uh, comfortable clothes, just loose, easy to get on and off, but nothing that would trip you up. Uh, bring your ID and your insurance card, unless you have been pre-registered and specifically instructed that you don't need your ID and your insurance card, plan to bring those with you. Uh, if you are having surgery at the hospital and are going to be staying overnight and you routinely use a CPAP machine, you will want to bring that with you. I get asked this all the time. Nail polish is okay. No problem with that. You want to bring uh, your walker and have it in the car uh, just for afterwards for getting home. You're going to see me briefly that morning of surgery, we're going to come in, we're going to mark the surgical site with my initials so that we're all agreed on uh, what joint we're working on. Um, please don't ask me if I really don't know or joke about the other side. It's, it's like making bomb jokes in the airport. We just don't do that. So we're going to confirm that we're all in agreement on the correct surgical site uh, this is a chance for you to ask me any last-minute questions. Hopefully with this video and our meetings in the office and our other interactions, you've gotten your questions answered. Uh, but if you think of some while you're watching this, email me, barbertotaljoint at alortho.com. Uh, but if we missed anything or something comes to mind that morning, that's a chance for me to answer that for you. You're going to have some very nice pre-op nurses that are going to interview you, ask you a lot of questions about your medical history, get everything documented for you. As we talked about previously, they are going to uh, clip the skin if there's any hair around the surgical site that would prevent us from placing a bandage or cause any other issues. They will probably uh, go over skin cleansing with you again, and they may... Uh, clean the area in the preoperative area, you'll also be given an IV. The anesthesiologist is going to come in and ask you more questions and talk about uh, their part of the process and what they're going to do. Uh, virtually every knee replacement patient and some hip replacement patients will have a nerve block uh, for pain control. At present, our anesthesiologists are using a long-acting local anesthetic with the blocks. This helps for the first uh, two to three days after surgery. It's uh, very helpful in contributing to your pain control, so uh, please know that that's going to happen and that you very definitely want that to happen. In addition to the nerve block, you will have either a spinal or a general anesthetic. I have done... Uh, a lot of both over the years. At present, probably more of our patients have spinal anesthesia, uh, but general works very well also, and you can discuss this with your anesthesiologist to determine which may be better for you. So you went through the pre-op, you went through anesthesia, and we have finally had this surgical event. You've had your knee or hip replacement. Afterwards, you'll be taken to recovery room, a physical therapist will see you uh, likely in the recovery room 
And what they're doing day of surgery is very simple. You just want to make sure that you're comfortable with standing balance, that you're not dizzy or overly nauseated, that you're able to walk with a walker and make a short trip to the bathroom. At that point, you're going to go somewhere. Uh, For many or most patients, you're probably going home. Uh, For some patients, you may uh, be headed to a hospital room for an overnight stay. Regardless, what happens at this point is basically the same. You are going to generally rest and take it easy that day of surgery. Um, Short walks only during this time, so just short trips to the bathroom with your walker, lots of time with the lower extremities elevated and ice or cold device on the surgical site. My series of exercises that you've already reviewed prior to surgery can be performed two or three times. That really is not a lot because the following day you'll be doing those uh, every hour while you're awake. We recommend that you not sleep with a pillow under the knee uh, with knee replacement. That can, if done excessively, cause the knee to heal in that contracted position and it can be difficult to get full extension. It's not that you can't ever put a pillow behind your knee, uh, but don't sleep that way. Uh, Try to sleep with the leg flat, with the foot or the calf supported, but nothing behind the knee. Post-operative day one, very common that the leg will be quite sore at this point. It's going to feel heavy. Some people may say that it feels like a log. You may have a burning sensation around the incision. That is all very, very normal. Big focus on using cold therapy and elevating the leg. Use your medications as they've been prescribed and your therapy protocol as it has been prescribed. Every hour while you're awake, you'll take a short walk and perform 10 ankle pumps. These are very important to helping prevent blood clots. You will do knee straightening and knee bending exercises 10 times if you've had a knee replacement. If you've had a hip replacement, you will just do the walk and the ankle pumps. You want to make sure on this day that you're drinking plenty of fluids. Uh, Eat Frequent small meals, everything's going to go a lot easier if you're not having a a couple of really large meals to try to digest, just kind of go a little bit slower with things. Make sure that every hour you're taking several deep breaths or coughing as needed to clear your lungs out from the surgery. Remember to take Miralax to prevent constipation. Uh, Your nerve block is starting to wear off a little bit and... The evening of this first night and into tomorrow is when the knee is probably going to swell the most if you've had a knee replacement. Similarly, the hip or the leg may swell the most if you've had a hip replacement. So do your exercises, but everything else should be very moderate. Make sure you're spending a lot of time with the the leg elevated, toes above the nose so that the fluid can drain back out of your leg and use your uh, cold therapy device frequently. Day two can be a tough one for a lot of people. Uh, The leg has pretty much reached uh, its its maximum swelling for most people at this point, and it may feel really tight or heavy. It may throb. Ice, elevation, the movements that we prescribe, those are all the things that are going to help with this. Continue that physical therapy protocol, deep breaths, every hour, lots of fluids, frequent small meals, and and make sure you're using medications as needed for constipation. You've got your medicines that you were prescribed. Use those to help control inflammation and pain. By day three and four, uh, you may have some bruising or some redness of the leg and some warmth. This is very normal after surgery, not indicative of infection. A lot of people will have warmth or even redness or bruising. You may have some fevers in those first couple of days after surgery. Usually your short walks, your deep breathing exercises, those things will help to resolve that. 
but it's very normal and not indicative that there's a problem. Keep doing the ice and elevation and the movements that we've talked about and following the uh, PT protocol, lots of fluids, small meals, a lot of the same things that you've been doing. If possible, as you start to get through those uh, first couple days where things were worse, uh, start to wean off of the narcotics if you can. Switch to more anti-inflammatory medicines, Tylenol, things like that. Day three to two weeks, uh, just generally covering these first couple weeks after surgery, very normal for the leg to be swollen. Now, if the swelling doesn't improve when you elevate or it seems to be getting worse, uh, check with our office. You may need an ultrasound to help rule out a blood clot. Uh, that is most commonly not the case. But if the swelling's not getting better with elevation, certainly let us know. Ice and elevation like we talked about, you're using your PT protocol, all the same things that have been going on before. Difficult for a lot of people to sleep in these first uh, few days, so take naps when you can and just try to use medications, ice, and elevation to get comfortable so that you can rest. Good nutrition during this time like we talked about. Make sure you're hydrating, getting plenty of protein, plenty of good healthy foods. For a lot of people, avoiding caffeine helps because, as we noted, sleep can be difficult during these first few weeks. Whenever you're comfortable, after the first couple of days, you can switch from a walker to a cane. We just want you to be safe and stable. So as long as you can do so uh, with a cane, it's fine to switch to that. A fair amount of people somewhere in that first week or 10 days will have a, a spike in pain where they were doing really well and then the, the pain just jumps up uh, for some reason. I've noticed this in up to about 10% of patients. Just be aware that that can be very normal. It's not indicative necessarily that there's any problem. Make sure that you use, uh, use your medicines appropriately. If you've started to get a little more comfortable and been a little more active, Make sure that you prop the leg back up, focus on your elevation and your icing. I've also commonly had patients tell me that somewhere between one and two weeks, 10 days, they'll have a little bit of a mini meltdown or just kind of get depressed or blue about things. Um, realize that you're okay. Uh, the way you're feeling right now is not forever just recovering from a big surgical event and it will get better and, and please know that a lot of people before you have gone through this same thing so just let us know uh, if we can help you but uh, it's going to be okay keep uh, trusting the process and working through this some patients while they're recovering will around this same time as they start walking may develop some sciatica they may say that they were doing really well then all of a sudden it felt like they couldn't put weight on their leg or they had shooting pain down their leg. I probably notice this a little more commonly with hip replacements than knees, but it can happen with either one. Just know that when we've done a big joint replacement surgery like this, we've altered your gait. So the way that you walk and the way that you stress your back and your adjacent joints has changed. And for some people, this will flare up a little bit of sciatica and they may have some problems, we can usually treat this uh, with medications, or if you need to come to the office, we can evaluate it or give you an injection or some other treatment to help with that. Some people are noticing during this time as they walk more that their knee does click or make some noise. Uh, you know this already, but that's typically very normal, not indicative of any problem. Now, if during this first couple weeks, you start having swelling or redness of the leg that doesn't get better with elevation, drainage from the bandage or things that seem uh, not right, uh, please let us know as these can be signs of infection. As we talked about, fever can be normal, but if you're consistently running a fever of 101 that doesn't get better and doesn't respond to Tylenol or Advil, let us know. Week two and after, as you proceed into the first several weeks and months of recovery after a joint replacement, 
please know that it is very normal to get stiff easily. A lot of patients will say when they sit for a while, when they ride in a car, or even first thing when they wake up, they're very stiff. It takes a few minutes to loosen the joint up and feel like they can walk. That's very normal. Your soft tissues are still very much healing from surgery, and they'll get sore easily, and they'll get stiff very easily. And some, some amount of this will probably continue for the first couple of months and will heal very gradually. As far as a return to driving, uh, there are a couple things to keep in mind. Usually much quicker for folks that are having surgery on their left knee or left hip than the right. Uh, never while you are on narcotics. So discontinue these medications before you start to drive. And really, uh, your surgeon never clears you for driving. You can drive when you are safe to do so. I don't know if you were a good driver before surgery. I don't know what kind of a driver you're going to be after surgery. So just make sure that you feel safe. Start off in a parking lot or just around the neighborhood and make sure you're comfortable in your vehicle before you get on the open road. In terms of taking care of your incision, we want uh, the incision to be fully healed, usually around three or four weeks. So everything's clean and dry. There's no scabs. Everything is sealed up, and we want it healed in this manner before you put any kind of lotions or ointments or anything like that uh, directly on the incision. Uh, once it's healed, you can massage the scar and, and massage the knee. Uh, patients will use cocoa butter, vitamin E cream, lotion, things like this to help smooth out the scar. And uh, applying these and massaging the area can help with the appearance of the scar and with the sensitivity of the incision. So that's perfectly fine, but just wait, wait and make sure that the incision is healed. No pools or tubs. Don't fully immerse or soak the knee or hip incision until it's fully healed. Again, really probably that four-week mark or so, but that can be a little longer or a little shorter just depending on how you heal. Certainly continue to wean off of uh, medications as much as possible during this time. As you get through the first month after surgery and are proceeding beyond week four, You'll hopefully be doing more and more and feeling better and better. Still may be difficult to sleep sometimes. A lot of patients struggle with this in the first three months or so after surgery. If you find that that's an issue, let our office know. Sometimes we can do some things to help you with that. Don't overdo it. You know, We want you to get back to your life, back to your activities, back to exercise and sports that you enjoy. Just do it very slowly and progressively. Think about increasing the volume and the intensity of what you do very slowly. For knee replacement patients, if you want to start to try to kneel during this time, just do it gently and occasionally. You may want to use a, a pad or a pillow for that. And even if you're able to get back to this, it may take several months. So you may need to practice on progressively harder surfaces like a pillow and then a towel and so on. Very normal for the surgical site to feel warm, uh, knees more so than hips, but even for the first six to 12 months after surgery, you may feel some warmth around that site if you compare it to the other side. And that's normal. Now, if it becomes increasingly red, swollen, or painful, certainly let us know. As we noted, it's okay to massage the scar once it's healed. Uh, after about four weeks or so, you can rub that area. That'll help to free up the skin and the soft tissues and will usually desensitize the area and make it feel better. During the first several months, you'll have follow-up visits with us, usually at two weeks after surgery, about six weeks after surgery. These may be adjusted depending on how you're doing. After that, if you're doing great and feel like you're healing well and progressing well, we may not see you for six months or a year. If you have any issues three, four months after surgery or you're still having trouble or feel like you're not getting well, make sure you come in and see us. Let us check that out. Make sure that everything is getting there. Uh, this can be a lengthy process of healing 
and we just want to make sure that everything is proceeding as it should. So if you have any issues, don't hesitate to let us know. But just be patient and know that this can be a lengthy process. Healing from a hip replacement is going to be six months to a year. And knee replacement can take a year to even 18 months. Now, you should be getting progressively better during that time, but it really takes a while for things to to fully mature and fully heal. We talked a little bit earlier about your dental care, but remember, any kind of elective dental cleaning or dental care, we want that to be three months or more after surgery. Let us know so we can get you an antibiotic prescription to take before that procedure. Common to still have stiffness like we talked about when you sit for a while or you're motionless, you may find that it takes a bit to get everything going. That will get progressively better. Make sure that you treat any infections. Now, in this instance, we're not referring to the hip or knee, but if you begin developing symptoms of urinary tract infection or tooth abscess or pneumonia, Make sure that you get seen by your primary doctor and get treated for those. Uh, We don't want any infections to seed bacteria into your bloodstream and cause an infection of your prosthetic joint. Again, as you get back to activities, you can play golf, you can ride a bike, you can swim. We want you to avoid impact loading if possible. Now, if your house is on fire, you can run out but uh, we don't want you training for a marathon. As we talked about, after joint replacement, we want to make sure that you have regular follow-up care. Hopefully, you're getting back to a life that is uh, free or substantially lessened of pain, and you're getting back to all the things that you want to do. And once things are going well and are healed, just see us every year or two for an x-ray to make sure that There are no issues, uh, that there aren't any minor problems that can be addressed before they turn into major problems. Always uh, call our office or email me if you have any questions or concerns.